Is Lamar Jackson the leader in the MVP conversation through three weeks of the 2022 season? We talk about that and more with a very special guest next year on Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we are back here, another episode of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher of Ravens Wire. We're here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for tuning in today, making Locked On Ravens your first listen. We're free and available on all platforms, including over on YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash Locked On NFL. We're back here on a midweek edition of the show after that Ravens 37 to 26 win over the New England Patriots. And here to talk with me about that, Lamar Jackson and more. You might have seen her everywhere. She is everywhere these days. The Winning Drive podcast with Cordell Woodland, friend of the show. You can hear her on 1057, talking with Tyus Bowser as well, maybe even hitting at some Ravens news over on Twitter here and there. It's Rita Hubbard. Rita, I'm really excited to talk with you. And especially after a win, those are always better. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to dive into that win against the Patriots because it wasn't necessarily a must win game in September. But after what happened in week two against Miami, it felt like they had to bounce back. And if they had lost this game, a lot of stuff would have been talked about surrounding this team. They get the win. It wasn't necessarily pretty in every aspect, but there were some areas that I was really impressed with, especially on the offensive side of the ball, namely Mr. Lamar Jackson himself. I mean, what you see from him, because I saw poise, confidence and stuff that I think has put him in that MVP conversation through three weeks. Absolutely. I mean, as of right now, Lamar is the MVP. And, you know, everybody, I know people love to fawn over Josh Allen. That's fine. Lamar leads the league in touchdowns. Lamar leads the league in quarterback rating. Um, And Lamar doesn't have a Stephon Diggs on his roster. Sure, he has a Mark Andrews. I mean, yes, that's fair. But I'm just making the point that A lot of people don't consider um, the wide receiving core to be as elite maybe as other teams. So for him to do this um, with the second year, Rashad Bateman with a Devin DuVernay is fantastic. And I do think that he is getting very comfortable in the pocket. You're seeing them now um, be under center more, which is something that we really weren't seeing in previous years. They, I think, exceeded um, their center snaps under center snaps from the previous three years combined um which is saying a lot that that means that they trust him that he's evolving and he's literally stood up to the challenge and he's he's killing it and so you know I, i'm just excited to see how this goes we're gonna find out how good this is um come sunday against the buffalo bills but for now you do have to feel good about two and one because they really should be three and zero if you think about it <laughs> yeah i mean they they were a couple big plays away against that miami yes. team and that fourth quarter collapse from being a three and oh team and, and it's Absolutely. been impressive rita because let's face it it's not the run game that's carrying this offense right now it is the passing game and lamar jackson and what he is able to do after so many people talked about i mean myself included how the personnel had shifted back to the bully ball and everything the run game has struggled while the pass off Offense has flourished, and a part of that has to do with players. You mentioned Rashad Bateman, Devin DuVernay, not a Stephon Diggs on that roster, but guys who are stepping up to the challenge. I Meaning against the Patriots, Devin DuVernay scores a phenomenal toe tap touchdown. Rashad Bateman has a couple of nice plays, including that ankle breaker where he gets yards after the catch. And we always know about Mark Andrews, two touchdowns for him. Those pass catchers were impressive in that game, Rita. What'd you see out of them? Absolutely. I mean, they they were phenomenal. Um, Rashad Bateman, obviously, on Sunday's game, we really didn't see much of. Um, and that'll happen. Sometimes guys get locked up, you know, and, and that's why you, it's important to have a Devin DuVernay that can complement uh, a Rashad Bateman well. Mark Andrews is just he's called Mandrews for a reason, right? (laughs) Like he's going to be him. Nobody's going to be able to stop him. And that's just what it is. I loved seeing guys like Josh Oliver get involved, his first ever touchdown. Uh, And so it's, it's fun to see how this passing offense is evolving. And it's crazy that we're saying that. And yet Lamar 
is 17th in passing yards. So it feels like it's evolving. But when you see um, the attempts and the yards, it's like, wow, I thought it would be much more considering they can't run the football or previously didn't run the football well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm curious to see if the run game opens this up a little more, a little more play action, a little more downfield. So um, it's just been fun to watch thus far. And and, and I, I see more guys stepping up to the plate. J- James Prochet, when he gets better, you know, potentially being a part of this as well. Demarcus Robinson, you know, he, he'll he he'll be more involved in the coming weeks. They're going to need him. So, yeah, it's it's been fun to watch. It has been, and I think also the fact that Lamar Jackson looks more confident behind that offensive line this year. I know last year, Rita, we were talking about an offensive line that every week was shuffling in and out at multiple positions. This year, it's been left tackle, where you don't have Ronnie Stanley back, Jawan James, Terrace's Achilles, McCarry goes out in week three. So in comes Daniel Falele, who had never played left tackle before, is only a right tackle in Minnesota, struggled a little bit early. You know, had a couple of things where he just was not able to get out of the set, but like the Ravens got him some help and he also was able to play a lot better. I mean, what you see from him, because he might have to go again in week four, maybe if guys aren't ready to go. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you hit it on the nail. Um, and my, I just think that as the game went on, he progressed and he got better and, you know, good job of Greg Roman getting him some help in the process of doing that because he's never played left tackle before we're on our fourth left tackle. Like, what are we doing here? You know what I mean? And so at first it looked like he didn't know what he was doing. And then eventually he got into a rhythm and it helped. Um, you hope that Ronnie Stanley is able to return with four because, you know, the Buffalo Bills absolutely have pass rushers. Vaughn Miller is playing out of his mind like he is a new guy on the scene. Um, and so you want to get some – you want – Lamar to have some help on the left side. But if Fa'alele is the guy that's going to do it, I I think that he did pretty well considering, you know, he had never played the position before. Obviously I think that you have to help him out in a situation if, if he's going against a guy like Vaughn Miller um, and and get, you know, a tight end or get the running back to chip a little bit. But, you know, I, I think he's up for the challenge and Lamar even said himself, like he could tell that as the game went on, he got better. So hopefully this continues if he has to start again at left tackle. Right, and Dietrich Wise is a very talented player for New England, but he is no Von Miller. Von Miller is one of the best in the business for a very long time. So you want to be able to get him some help over there. But, Rita, on the defensive side of the ball, a mixed bag in some aspects, definitely. They did get gashed on multiple big plays. The run defense was not up to par. And it's crazy because over the past couple of years, we've seen a Ravens run defense that has dominated and been really good, a top rushing defense. But against the Patriots, it, it just felt like those holes were opening up and guys weren't getting off of their blocks and missed tackle here and there. Are you concerned about the run defense at all? Yes. And I mean, you know, not a huge, not as concerned as I am about the secondary, but yes, I am concerned about the run defense. Like you said, they, they have, that has been one thing that they have been dominant in years past and now you know it just doesn't really feel like there's some consistency there and I think that Michael Pierce had had done a really good job prior to being injured and helping that Um, but the rotation of the other guys is where you know we are starting to see some some cracks there and maybe it just needs some more reps and more consistency to play together to happen but it is a concern I mean particularly because you know you're not doing particularly well in the past defense so your run defense was one thing that you felt like you could depend on that the Ravens were going to stop and, and and be good at. I don't really look at the Dolphins game in that regard because I think at that point they were spent. Um, you know, they had been out on the field that fourth quarter pretty heavily. And, you know, some sometimes, you know, it just wears you down in that regard. Um, but yeah, yeah, last week it's kind of like, okay, y'all have to find a way to, to to tighten this up a little bit. Um, you do wonder if they if it's going to happen now with the Michael Pierce injury. We don't know how long he's going to be out, and that's a huge injury. Do you call Brandon Williams back? Is he busy? I mean, does he want to come back? Do you just rely on the young guys that you already have and hope that they stay? step it up that's the question that the Ravens have to answer but they definitely need to find you can't be bad at both you can't be bad at the run defense and pass defense pick a struggle okay but it can't be both (laughs) I mean last year we saw that where the the pass defense was bottom five in a ton of categories but the rush defense was top five top three a lot and this year Rita to your point the Ravens in terms of yards per attempt they have the 
30th best pass defense and out of 32 teams, so not great. In rush defense, they're 26th in yards per attempt. So they are a bottom 10 unit in both of those aspects. So they do have to get better, I agree. And at least one of them, and they have the talent in the secondary, but injuries, we've seen them early on in the secondary. Yep. But the secondary came up big against the Patriots in terms of turnovers. They did a lot of Vontae Parker to have a ungodly stat line in that game for them. But Marcus Peters interception to seal the game. And you have Marlon Humphrey interception in the end zone. But the one that sticks out to me, Reed, is the Kyle Hamilton fumble on Nelson Aguilar, where, look, he, he talked about the miscommunications against Miami in week two. We took accountability. And a lot of people said, that's great, but let's see it on the field. You know, let's see the improvements. And he showed that improvement and I think made the biggest play of the game. And Marcus Peters, that fumble recovery is a bit underrated too. I agree. And in, in, in terms of Kyle Hamilton, I was one of those people that said that accountability is great, but now action has to take place. And and guess what? He turned around and he had action. And I hope that that's something that Kyle Hamilton can build from because he's had a slow start um, thus far. You know, he hasn't had the best. He's had some moments, right? He's had he's made some hits, which we, we talked about that, that being the concern in preseason. But then he had some hits in the regular season. Um, and then there's the miscommunications that he's had. So I hope that this, you know, starts Kyle Hamilton to build some confidence because I'm sure he knew uh, about his his mishaps, let's call it, you know, in previous games or whatever. And uh, he can build from that. You know, it, it's very important for, you know, your teammates to feel like, that you are contributing to what it is that they're doing. And there's video, of course, of him coming on the sideline after the fumble, um, him punching at the ball and like all the guys like yelling and stuff. I'm sure that was a great feeling for him. Just felt like he contributed to, to the win because he really did. That was a key play in turning that ball over because prior to that, New England was moving the ball. So I, I just really hope he can build from that and that he can continue to get consistent moving forward. Yeah, I think people, you know, the play was so good, but New England was only down five in that situation. That Aguilar right. play would have gone for 30, 40, 50 yards, and yep. they would have been deep into Baltimore territory. And the momentum with that play, if he had gone down and the ball still in his hands, the momentum's all the way on New England's side. You're thinking, is the yep. defense going to blow another lead? But Hamilton shows up, steps up, and makes the play. So that was really, really big for him. Coming up here in the second segment, though, we're going to be talking about Lamar Jackson some more in that MVP conversation and something that he is in the front for. So be sure to stay tuned. We still have a ton to talk about here on the show. But first, I do want to tell you a bit about LinkedIn. And as you gear up for the fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. I've used LinkedIn for a ton of things in my life. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs. Reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that your hiring service network can help you find the right people to hire. They have simple tools you can use like screening questions that make it easy to focus on your candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who to hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. As you know, every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. Post your job free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on NFL to post your job free. Terms and conditions apply. We're back here with our second seven of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still here with Rita Hubbard. And Rita, with Lamar Jackson, we knew that this was going to be a big year for him. We, we know the contract situation. We're not going to get into that. <laughs> it's just like the Ravens and Lamar are tabling right. those talks. But in terms of his play on the field, my, my whole thing, Rita, was the price of Lamar Jackson was always going to go up. You know, I know the injury situation with him, if he gets injured, what's it going to do to the contract? But he's such a polarizing player. And, and we have seen now through these three weeks, he has put himself at the forefront of that conversation. Conversation. And part of it, Rita, is the efficiency that I've been blown away by with Lamar Jackson because he's doing this. You know, you mentioned the passing yardage. He has an 11.4 touchdown percentage, which means he's throwing a touchdown on 11.4% of his passes, which I think is incredible. Un unbelievable. In the words of the famous Fat Joe, yesterday's price is not today's price. <laughs> so every time he continues to go out on that field, every time his stock continues to rise. And look, I don't fault anybody. You know, Lamar probably felt like he was worth a certain amount. The Ravens probably were, um, you know, concerned about the amount because of the style of play that he has but guess what you can't do that anymore that young man is playing at such a great level that you can no longer deny what he's doing and you have to find a way to pay him because if you don't pay him someone else is going to pay him um and so you know 
I, if Lamar gets another MVP season, hey, man, uh, the Ravens, you, you probably should have just paid him what he wanted last year because he's going to want more money this year for <laughs> sure, right? So, you know, it'll be interesting how this goes. But the way that Lamar is trending, um, you know, he he's scheduled to, to, to have, what, over 50 touchdowns? I mean, just based on what, what the metrics are now. Uh, well. Good luck to you, uh, Baltimore Ravens front office, because it's going to be a very interesting offseason if this young man finds a way to win MVP again, which he right now, there's nobody else better than him. No, and I, I agree with you. I mean, people talk about Jalen Hurts and that he's had a phenomenal start to his year yes. as well. You, you mentioned Josh Allen. Patrick Mahomes always finds his way in these conversations because of the player that he is. But when you when you break it down, Rita, and you talk about a liter, like the literal term MVP, it is most valuable player. And I think when you're talking about to a team, Lamar Jackson, the Ravens knew when they took him in 2018, they were going to have to, when he was ready to be the guy, they were going to have to flip their entire offense, their entire scheme, the personnel, some of the coaching staff as well. He is this Ravens offense. He is this Ravens team. And there, there are plenty of players you can argue, well, if this guy goes out, they only win four games or they only win five games. But for Lamar Jackson, one, we saw it last year, the, the not no disrespect to Tyler Huntley, but the drop off between Lamar Jackson and Tyler Huntley. And I think when you talk about who is a, the most valuable player to their team, I think that is Lamar Jackson. Absolutely. He accounts for 86% of the Ravens offense, eight, six. Okay. Uh, that's unreal. And we know that, cur you know, currently the um, Ravens run game has been very anemic and that's me being nice about it. Uh, so if, without Lamar Jackson running the ball, who is their top rusher on the team as of uh, right now, um, they can't move the ball in that regard. Although they did have some better success last Sunday. But prior to that, Lamar was basically the run game. And then the passing game, we've seen what he's done as well. So, I mean, if, if a person is accounting for nearly 90% of what a team is doing, oh, and by the way, they have the number one offense currently in the National Football League. That says a lot about how great this one specific player is. And again, that's what most valuable player is. You mentioned Jalen Hurts. And look, Jalen Hurts is playing phenomenal. Jalen Hurts also has Devontae Smith. Jalen Hurts also has A.J. Brown. Jalen Hurts also has a very good run game. The Ravens don't have any of that. Lamar is the offense. Without him, they are nothing. And that's just the bottom line. It is. And when you, when you look back to his 2019 MVP season, Rudy, I put these stats out. You know, he had 1,035 total yards and eight total touchdowns through three weeks of 2019. In 2022 through three weeks, it's 992 total yards and 12 touchdowns, which goes back to the efficiency where he has four more touchdowns and just a, a tick less of yards, which I think is impressive. And you see him every week. It's getting, you know, three total touchdowns, four total touchdowns, five total touchdowns. It's continuing to go up. And he's doing it against defenses that aren't necessarily bottom units, you know, where they, necessarily top two defenses no I mean the Jets aren't a top two unit but you, you play who's in front of you Lamar Jackson has done that and I think the key point that you're making and I agree is the fact that look he doesn't have a, a Stephon Diggs like Buffalo went out and got Josh Allen they, they didn't go out and get him a DeAndre Hopkins like the Cardinals did for Kyler Murray Rashad Bateman's talented you know Devin DuVernay's talented but that that's not their number one star receiver I mean the number one pass catcher is Mark Andrews 100 percent but right. you know when you talk about this Ravens offense in the way that Lamar Jackson you you like uh, hit it on the head, is the run game. They have not been able to establish nearly anything. Justice Hill really the only bright spot in that run game right now. He's someone who is a dual threat player. I mean, we talk about his arm and his legs being things that go hand in hand. But, I mean, defenses, when they game plan for the Ravens, right, it's it's about Lamar Jackson. It's all about Lamar Jackson. I think that's what makes him another another part of this MVP conversation is the fact that, you know, we talk about him being the entire offense. You mentioned that 86%. But the fact that defenses have to game plan for him, have to simulate him in practice, I mean, it speaks to the greatness that he has. Absolutely. And and last year we saw the whole cover zero, uh, cover blitz, cover zero blitzes that were being done by opposing teams. I don't think you can do that anymore. And, and the Miami did try to do that. And they had a little bit of success, but not the way that we saw them successful last year. Lamar is now finding ways to get the ball out. He's getting the ball in the flat to the running back, something he really wasn't doing a ton of last year. Um, you know, he's he's just living to see another down, not trying to force it. And 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 that's what you 
you want, right? Something that he didn't do last year that he's evolving from this year. Him just simply just checking it down when it's not available, big, because that's not something that he typically would do. Because, you know, when you have the talent that Lamar Jackson has, lots of times you don't want to check it down because it's like, I'm Lamar Jackson. I can get the same amount of yards with my legs as opposed to giving it to this guy, right? And the, the league just doesn't work that way, right? It's it's too fast sometimes for that type of logic, even though we know that Lamar is fast. But with the cover zero blitz situation, you know, and, and on top of that, they're sealing the edges. They're not allowing Lamar to rush outside anymore like he used to. So that's why you like to see the evolution of him saying, okay, they're, they're typically not letting me rush outside anymore. Let me just go ahead and throw this ball to this running back. And that's great part. Just little things that he's working on that's getting better that's what makes this so great to see and you know just the things that you like okay well he could do this he could be better you know throwing outside the numbers okay well he's getting better throwing outside the numbers you know he could do better you know dumping it off when when something's not there he's doing that and so as a result all we're seeing is results execution and that's the part that that that's really great to see so yeah, there's nobody out there right now that at this moment that is better than Lamar Demetrius Jackson in the quarterback position. It's just the truth. <laughs> it is. I 100% agree. And I, I talk about that fact with Gus Edwards a little bit too, Rita, where we've seen improvement and evolution in each of his first three years before the ACL injury for him. With Lamar Jackson, it's the same thing. And we know how hard he works, how competitive he is. And it's not like, you know, he's posting every single day, like, oh, I'm doing this this day. I'm doing this that day. But we've yeah. seen the hard work. I know there was a lot of controversy about the OTAs thing earlier in the offseason, but he was doing stuff with his own with his own people. He was working out with his quarterback coach, who he, he credits a lot of stuff to, and he has gotten better. And I think also, Rita, pushing the ball down the field has been something the Ravens have wanted to do this year. But the short passing game also has been really impressive. And I think that's a blitz beat or two. When you have seven, eight guys coming at you, you can dump the ball off to somebody and there aren't any defenders out there in space. You can send blockers out there and that's really important. And also that you have to have defenders respect that. And it, it, it all, it all goes hand in hand with each other. And I, I give the Ravens offense a lot of credit for, I think, adjusting in games, the more Jackson adjusting in games. And it seems like he has more control over this offense than we've seen in recent years. Absolutely. And, and I, you know, one thing that I wanted them to work on and, and they still haven't fully worked on it, but you see them getting better is um, getting the call in, you know, in a good enough time. So then he can get to the line, read the defense. If he needs to check out of that, you know, call he can, which it appears that he's been doing um, this season. But I agree, like having a guy like Rashad Bateman that can run a good slant route. If you're in a blitz situation, hey, he gonna, he's going to make you pay. He's going to make you pay if you come for him and you and you let that guy find a way to get open. He's going to take it to the house. We've seen it happen before. So um, it's just really good to see how everything has has basically come to, to circle, full circle, I guess, for lack of a better term, with Lamar. Because everything that every, people said that he needed to work on or he needed to like get better at to be elite, he's done that. And he's showing that he put in the work. And now you're having guys that, you know, currently were previously so critical, media people that were critical about Lamar now having to eat their words because he's done the work and it shows and it's showing in the scoreboard. I mean, like who else is, is scoring as many points as the Ravens right now? It's, it's, it's phenomenal. And 33 points a game for this offense around that through three weeks is great. Yep. And I think when you're you're talking about just the concerns that the run game has, you know, can be crippling sometimes where defense can hone in on one thing. And if you're struggling, it doesn't work. Well, Lamar Jackson has been so electric where he has been able to adjust. I mean, the Jets game where the Ravens literally could get nothing on the ground. Miami, where Mike Davis averaged 0.8 yards per carry for Mark Andrews was yards per carry in the running backs. It was it was unbelievable. You have Lamar Jackson saying, I'm going to put the team on my back. And he is the run game. He is the pass game. You mentioned he's he's the offense. And the cherry on top of this, Rita, is what, what a guy to root for. Just the person that right. he is and the personality that he is, respectful. He, he, he's just – how can you root against Lamar Jackson? That's what I want to know. I would love to know what it is about him that you don't like, that you can't root against him. It, it, it's just something that I don't really understand. You know, on the field he's doing what he's doing. Because, honestly, it look, to the point where Lamar – if 
he had an agent. Somebody would have, the agent would have told him, hey, don't show up to the training camp. Don't do a thing until you get your money. And Lamar said, I love my teammates. I love this game so much. I'm just not willing to do that. Most people are not doing that. Most people love money more than they love anything else. You know what I mean? Um, and, and the fact that he, you know, put his teammates and, 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 and his love for the game over, you know, the bigger picture, which is financially, I want to be set is it says a lot about him. And, and it's, really nice to see from as far as the run game is concerned you know he does help with that and I do think that J.K. Dobbins you know coming back can help this run game get better but Lamar unfortunately for now he still has to be part of that process until J.K. can fully get his feet in you know and and hit the ground running for lack of a better term got his feet wet last week and it was good but you know until J.K. can fully get to where to be Lamar is going to once again, have to be a part of this running offense. Yeah, he, he has been a huge part of them. He's been the reason they have won these games this year. And honestly, you mentioned they should be 3-0. Yeah, what goes lost in that loss is the fact that Lamar Jackson played phenomenal football for pretty much the entirety of that Miami game. So a phenomenal player, a phenomenal person, and someone that you know you just can't not root for. But coming up in our final segment, we'll be diving a bit into the Buffalo Week 4 matchup for Baltimore and more. So be sure to stay tuned here. We're going to be right back on Locked on Ravens. We're back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens here with Rita Hubbard, Kevin Ostrecker, your host, still here with you as well. And Rita, before we dive into Buffalo, the Ravens have had a rotating door at the outside linebacker position this year. You know, it started in the offseason. And even you could even go back to the 2021 season where Tyus Bowser gets injured. The torn Achilles just puts a horrible end to a horrible season injury wise. And then you have Vince Beagle tearing his Achilles. Stephen Means tearing his Achilles. David Ajabo coming back from a torn Achilles. There's been all these injuries. And then you see Justin Houston, who I thought had had a great start to the year, go down with a groin injury. And we don't know right now how long that absence is going to be. Now, they bring in Jason Pierre-Paul. They've signed players to their practice squad as well. A new one actually being added yesterday. But, I mean, is, is this a big area of concern for you, Rita? Because the pass rush right now – it's been a mixed bag. We've seen some great days. We've also seen some not great days. Yeah, it's a concern big time because Justin Houston was your most consistent pass rusher, and now he's uh has a groin injury. And they seem confident that this won't be a long-term injury, but Justin Houston is a much older player than, say, you know, uh, a David Ajabo or a, a Dafe away, you know what I mean? So I don't know how long this will be. You hope it's not that much longer because you already are inconsistent when it comes to the pass rush because away has not been able to get to, you know, shed his blocks to get the pressure. So, you know, this is a concern and we obviously don't know when Tyus will be back. He feels as though he'll be back soon, but listen, JK Dobbins felt though he was going to be back sooner than what he was. Sometimes you just want to be back sooner than when, you, your body actually says it's time. So um, I just hope that the Ravens find a way to, to get some schemes. And look, you're going to have to find some exotic blitzes to do. Kyle Hamilton hopefully can help you in that regard because you can kind of use him as a linebacker in certain situations um, and, and, and figure that out. But you hope JP, uh, JPP can come in and doesn't probably know the system at all, but hey, just go after the quarterback. Just do that real quick, you know, and, and, and hopefully he can, he can, um, you know, he always knows how to do that. That ain't hard. You don't need a, you don't need a, a sequence of words to tell you how to go to the quarterback. So, I mean, this is something that we, we've talked about, like you said, since 2021, this has just been an issue, an issue. And then you have injuries of guys that you thought would be helpful in that situation. Now they, they can't contribute. So it just, it continues. And, and, and I am concerned. It's a concern, particularly when you play teams like the Bills and then the following week you play um, the Bengals. So, you know, hopefully they can find a way to to, to make this work. I, I'm hoping. And it really seems really like Tyus Bowser would solve so many of these issues Absolutely. the Ravens have. He showed – that he can be a pass rusher in increased opportunities. I mean, he led the team in sacks last year, and I argue that he was Baltimore's most consistent defender in yep. 2021. He was that good, and the fact that he goes down with the Achilles, is, is it's heartbreak for so many people involved. But you mentioned it off A.O.A., Rita, and has had an, I'd say, interesting start to the year after the expectations that were placed upon him being the new number one guy for them. Hasn't really stepped up to those expectations. Has been double-teamed, right? I'm, I'm not going to say yeah, he, he hasn't been facing double-teamed, but I think 
and Owe talked about it a little bit. He said, you know, you have to find ways to overcome that and get to the quarterback. If you had to, if we had a meter of 10, Rita, what's your concern level with Owe and his production so far? Not being able to get off to, to get off the blocks, get off the double teams. You know, you're a first round draft pick, so you know you you know you got to find a way to 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 get off that because he hasn't always been double teamed either. You know, yes, he has, but then there's been situations where they just they're going right at him too and and they knocking him down. And so that's another thing he can't he's not allowed to seal the edge. It, it's it's just a situation of I can't get past the, these blockers and and. I have to figure out a way to do that. I hope he figures it out soon. I hope it's by Sunday because they're going to need him to do a lot more if Justin Houston can't go. But um, as of right now, it's been a disappointing three games for away. And you just hope that he can kind of get out of this funk and find a way to shed his block, uh, the blockers and, and get to the quarterback. He has zero quarterback like hits or, or right. anything thus far right. coming into the season. I, that says a lot. It does. And and I think it's going to be really important. You mentioned it, this Buffalo team, you, you have to make Josh Allen uncomfortable. And that barely, rarely happens for any team. I mean, he's so confident back there as well. But for an offense that has to find digs and they're able to just have the ability for Josh Allen to get out, pick up yards with his legs. We've seen that multiple times. Owe is a huge part of what they have to be able to do on Sunday. And Rita, with this Buffalo team coming to Baltimore, this is a game that's highly anticipated. Still don't know how it's not prime time, but here we are, one o'clock on CBS for some reason. But I don't have- mind it. I yeah, don't like I mean, prime time. From, I don't like prime time games. <laughs> from from a, from a content perspective, I appreciate it. From a matchup perspective, I think the NFL might regret it once the final sure. clock hit zero. Absolutely, and I think when you're talking about a Buffalo team, Rita, that. This year, the opposing offense is a top 15 unit in both passing and rushing offense when you're looking at yards per attempt. What are the biggest keys for you? Because obviously slowing down Josh Allen and Stephon Days, right? Those are two things you absolutely have to do. But I think being able to take away Buffalo's run game and make the offense a little one-dimensional in Buffalo is going to be key too. Yeah, and and that would be helpful if your run defense was actually playing half decent, right? Um, you know, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too hard. To, in the past, it wouldn't have been too hard to do that because they they have injuries there as well. But um, now you just don't know, right? Um, because of the the lack of Michael Pierce, because you know of the linebacker situation. So um, you hope that that's the case that you know to make them one dimensional. Um, and then just focus on bracketing Stephon Diggs and maybe McKenzie, you know, make sure McKenzie's taken care of. But um, that's a concern. You know, if, if they can, if they start doing some play actions and all of that stuff, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, when when you're looking at this Ravens offense, I think combating the Bills offense, I think this is going to be a high powered affair either way. Yeah. And part of that is the fact that Buffalo secondary, you know, we talk about injuries here in Baltimore. The Buffalo secondary is just beat up. They are injuries right now. They're they're relying on guys who haven't played a ton. And it's every week they, they just lost another one of their corners who's not going to be able to, to step up and play for them here. I think if you're the Ravens offense, we've seen the pass game and Lamar Jackson be so effective this year. We talked about them pushing the ball down the field and also the short passing game going hand in hand with each other. A key for me is to get the pass game going so the defense has to focus on that. And then you can maybe get these running backs going a little bit like J.K. Dobbins, Justice Hill, et cetera. I agree. Um, I think uh, is it, uh, Kyer Elam is probably the one that's, and he's played phenomenal, but he's a rookie nonetheless, you know, so the inexperience can potentially come out and bite and bite him um, in some type of way. I, I hope that you can run an up-tempo style because of the pass rush situation with Buffalo and because you're um, not, your uncertainty at left tackle, get the ball out fast, you know, like throw some quick routes, throw some, get just find ways to, to get out and dink it, dunk it a little bit, you know, make, but stay on the field, keep them tired. You know what I mean? And like you said, then allowing the run game to complement a short passing game. And then when it's, and then when it's ready, you throw those bombs down the field. I just don't want, I just want, remember the Two weeks ago against Miami, they had a super long drive, I think, going into the second quarter, I believe. That's what I want. I want you to find a way to get a 10-play, 12-minute drive out of this and get that defense tired and, you know, 
force uh, Buffalo to, to not have a ton of time if you find your way up in situations. And hopefully the run game can do that because that's what was missing two weeks ago. Not being able to get those third and ones, those fourth and ones, which allowed Miami to get the, the ball back in, a, in position to win. So you have to find a way to wear them down and wear them down you know, melodically and in a smart way. And I think doing that is just kind of getting some short and intermediate passes going, get the run game going, some play action going, and just staying on the field, keeping that Buffalo defense on the field and, and getting away from the pass rush as much as you can. Hey, that screen that you ran week one, we'd like to see <laughs> that again. That was really good. Do it again. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think I've ever been so exhilarated seeing a screen before. I know. After, after the the years and years of you know the fan base begging for it and just the the they haven't been able to do it for I don't even going back how long now. Those are the types of plays we talk about. The blitz beaters screens are an extension of the run game, and they're able to do that. And Rita, to your point, I think that what made that Miami game so frustrating late was the fact that we've seen the Ravens offense in 2019 and 2020 have those eight, nine, 10 yard or 10 minute drives. They pick up 50, 60 yards and they just wear that defense down, run the clock down. They needed one of those drives in a 21 point game and they got just none of one. Them. Exactly. And we saw they had that drive that you were mentioning. I think it was like what 18 plays or something mm -hmm. and they don't even score on it. They, they get stopped at the one yard line. So those short yarded situations, a key for me going into the year was getting themselves in those situations. I've had to add on to that because now you got to convert in those situations too. Right. On the third and shorts, the fourth and shorts. And but look, Buffalo's defense is really, really good. They're a top three team in both rush defense and pass defense when looking at yards per attempt. So this is this is going to be a challenge, a really tough game. But I think Baltimore is up for it. Buffalo just went through an extremely emotionally draining game in Miami. Baltimore had a really good game against the Patriots. I mean, this is a game I think is going to be high scoring. I mean, how, how do you see this one going? Do you have any predictions for this game? I don't yet, but I, I, you know, I do think this is going to be a back and forth simply because you mentioned that there's um, a lot of secondary issues and injuries from Buffalo side. And then obviously we know that the Ravens can't get right <laughs> on the secondary of their side. Um, so this might be a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth game. You know what I mean? Uh, and so maybe it's going to be the team, the, the last team with the possession of the ball at the end of the game wins, but hopefully it's the Ravens and, and hopefully, Hopefully they can find a way to, to win a shootout, maybe uh 42 39 or something like that. <laughs> if, if, if the NFL had that at one o'clock slot, they would be kicking themselves for a while. But again, you and I, Rita, I know that the primetime games, it, it's, it's a little tough when it comes to just making stuff and just going to bed. Just going yes. To bed <laughs> and, and honestly, I don't like to wait. My anxiety is already started because it's Sunday. So then right. I have to go from having anxiety, you know, only to one o'clock to anxiety at two, eight o'clock. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> and it, it goes through the entire game. You have to be there for three hours. You got to calm down after the game. And it's, yep. it's, it's this whole event where, you know, you have that at 4 p.m. You're like, all right, you, you can get to bed. Fine. Exactly. Right. 11 p.m. You're thinking, man, you're up till 12, 1, 2. It, it, it's crazy. The Browns game a couple years ago. Uh, <laughs> was it last year? Or was that last year? The, the, the game, you know, where Lamar goes to the bathroom. Uh, yeah, uh, two years ago. Yeah, so that game, that's that game even happened, and I don't think I could get to bed till one o'clock, and I had to go to work the next day. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> it, it becomes such a unbelievable twist in terms of you know they're thinking that you're they're down, and then they come back and you're invested yeah. again, and it, it's all these things. So this Buffalo game, I think, has potential to be an unbelievable one of those classic games. I mean, you have a game that arguably could be Baltimore's biggest in Week Four. Of, of the season. So it's a big early test for them. And I think it's going to be a good one, but Rita, I appreciate you hopping on with me here today. Thank you so much. Please tell people where they can find you and what you're working on. Thanks again for having me. You can find me on Twitter at the NFL chick at gridiron gals as well. That is um, the podcast with myself and my co-host Chels. We talk college football, NFL. I'm on every Sunday for Ravens post game uncensored on 105.7 The Fan with my guy, Glenn Clark. And then the winning drive podcast with myself and Cordell Woodland from 105.7 The Fan. She is everywhere, and her links will be in the description below. I'll be sure to put all that in there. Great insight, Rita. Thank you so much again. I really do appreciate it. That's all I have for you here today on Locked on Ravens. We'll get back here tomorrow. We'll be diving into more Ravens content, previewing that Buffalo game with the Bills. So be sure to stay tuned for that, and I will see you right back here tomorrow.